Dr. Studley, you are good to go whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much, Caitlin. So thanks for asking me to, to talk. I'm, you know, I'm sorry we're not all meeting in person. Uh, I'm missing, missing catching up for these things, but anyway. Uh, I don't have any, anything to declare. And before I start, I want to just let you know what I'm doing today. So I'm in uh, in Sydney, and uh, later today I'm going up to uh, to a place called Coffs Harbour, which is halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. And the reason I'm doing that is to do a um, is that there is there's essentially no neurosurgery service between just north of Sydney and just south of Brisbane. So that's a thousand kilometres, and so. For about 700 kilometres along the east coast, there's no neurosurgery unit, and so we do remote clinics. So I have a regular clinic and operating session up in in Coffs Harbour, and generally I'll fly to go up there. But um, but today, because the flights are, are cancelled because of the COVID shutdown, I'm having to drive up. So when you're in you're in bed, I'll be driving up up there. Um, while I'm up there, I get the opportunity to stay at my farm, which is a we, we grow macadamias, which are native to the area. They're not from Hawaii, they're from the east coast of Australia. And that's the view from the, the back veranda. We have some cattle and, and alpacas, and sometimes visitors, visitors like this little guy. So that's what I'll be doing today. So just getting on to Chiari in, in pregnancy, um, I'm gonna go through these things. So first of all, talking about what our concerns might be about uh, about Chiari pregnancy. And so really, I think that's about, do patients get worse during pregnancy? But in particular, are there dangers, dangers during delivery, uh, perhaps in the early postpartum period? And I'll talk a little bit about, about those factors as well in, in syringa myelia. I'll also then just mention a bit about what is actually done. So there are the concerns and then what is actually happening in practice. And then I'll close by talking about what my my approach is for what that's worth. So in terms of the first question, do symptoms get worse during pregnancy? Well, there's really very little information to, to answer that question. There's one uh, publication from a few years ago from uh, Graham Flint, actually, looking at uh, his experience over 10 years. And they had 21 women uh, who had 23 pregnancies. Four of those patients had Syringa myelia, and they made a. They were talking mostly about the uh, obstetric management and the process of delivery, but they did make the point that there were no serious neurological symptoms during pregnancy, or, although two of the patients had uh, had some worsening symptoms, but nothing that was particularly problematic. In my own experience, I've had a lot of patients who have had um, pregnancy and delivery um, either having had treatment for Chiari or have had Chiari that hasn't been treated. And it's a very unscientific thing I know, but my experience is that there's not really been any significant change in symptoms uh, for Chiari patients during pregnancy uh, or delivery. That's certainly not anything I've uh, been aware of in my patients. But that's really the extent of, of the evidence in the literature, I think, in terms of uh, any, any kind of series. So really the main question though is, are there any dangers for Chiari patients during, uh, during delivery? And I think that really comes to, are there pressure changes that occur during the processes of um, uterine contraction, bearing down the valsalva type uh, maneuvers that are involved in, in delivery? And would that lead to any worsening of tonsil herniation and compression of the brainstem, which would be the, the concern that there'd be some uh, significant or uh, catastrophic neurological change from worsening of the, of the tonsil herniation in Chiari malformation. So what is the evidence for that? Well, in the 19, 1960s, they were able to put needles into people uh, to do experiments. And so uh, there are a few patient, few papers where they actually measured the uh, lumbar CSF pressure and intrauterine pressure at the same time uh, in, in healthy patients, volunteers. So in those studies, um, slightly conflicting uh, results in, 
in a couple of them uh, in 1962, the conclusions were that uterine contraction itself did not directly affect uh, CSF pressure, but that the pain associated with contractions led to uh, a valsalva type of response with increased ab intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressure that, that did elevate uh, the lumbar CSF pressure. There was a, another third paper though in 1965 that found a small increase in CSF pressure, I think by about two centimetres of water, uh, directly related to uterine contraction. So this is not Chiari patients, this is, this is normal people, but just demonstrating that the process of uh, vaginal delivery can result in changes in CSF and, and of course, intracranial pressure. Uh, Bernard Williams uh, did some studies looking at changes in pressure in Chiari patients. So uh, he was able to measure uh, intracranial pressure and lumbar CSF pressure simultaneously in Chiari patients. This is not Chiari patients who are pregnant or uh, delivering babies, but just in Chiari patients. So looking what happens when they have a Valsalva maneuver and showed that the the lumbar pressure went up greater than the intracranial pressure uh, at the early stages of Valsalva, but the, when the Valsalva maneuver was released, there was a slight negative difference, meaning that the intracranial pressure was greater than the spinal pressure for a period of time. And this is what uh, led to his uh, description of the craniospinal pressure dissociation. But just I think worth bearing in mind that the, the results showed a higher pressure in the spinal CSF initially than in the intracranial uh, space. This is for Chiari patients. And then there's John's uh, wonderful paper from uh, 20 years, more than 20 years ago now, John, um, showing that in Chiari patients, again, not, not pregnant patients, but Chiari patients with spinal pressure monitoring, that there was a uh, a delay in the transmission of intracranial pressure during uh, valsalva and jugular compression maneuvers compared to normal patients where the normal people where the pressure transmission is very rapid when with those maneuvers that in Chiari patients there was there appeared to be a block or a, a uh, slower transmission of uh, pressure from the head to the spine and I suppose you might uh, then argue that in in pregnant patients who are doing those maneuvers, that that might uh, also be the case, that there'd be a delay in transmission of pressure uh, that might indicate a pressure differential between the head and the spine. But does any of that lead to a problem? Um, is there any evidence that in pregnant patients uh, delivering their babies, that there is any uh, tonsillar, increase in tonsillar herniation and brainstem compression. There are, there are lots of case reports of uh, anaesthetic uh, and obstetric management of individual patients um, in, with Chiari who deliver uh, babies and mostly they're, they're really just successful uh, cases where they manage the mother and baby without any complications. So I won't really talk about any of the case reports, but there are some series that look at uh, numbers of patients and this first one from 2013 uh, had their own patient, one patient in a, in a literature review, really looking at the uh, spinal anesthetic management or neuraxial uh, anesthetic management, so epidural or spinal management for uh, analgesia or cesarean section for delivery in Chiari patients. But they made the, this, this quote is from their paper saying, the contractile force of the uterus on cerebral spinal fluid can cause an increase in ICP and unsuspected herniation, meaning herniation of the cerebellar tonsils. Well, of course, there's absolutely no evidence for that. And the only, uh, the only evidence I've been able to find for changes in ICP with, uh, with uterine contraction was the papers from the 1960s that I mentioned earlier. So this uh, study looking at the 22 patients uh, with various uh, methods of analgesia found no problems with uh, 
with uh, neurological uh, changes in the mother and the, the normal sort of obstetric uh, postpartum uh, problems, but nothing that could be attributed to the Chiari malformation. So these are all Chiari patients, uh, all undergoing um, uh, delivery with spinal or epidural anaesthetic and with no, uh, no reported problems. Then coming back to uh, Roper's paper, this is one with Graham Flint as one of the co-authors, looking at their 10-year experience with uh, 23 deliveries. Uh, four of the patients had syringomyelia, six had had their Chiari uh, malformations treated, uh, so the majority had not had their Chiari treated. And uh, again, the, obstet the uh, uh, normal sorts of obstetric uh, uh, consequences, but but no neurological uh, consequences of, uh, of delivery. So uh, most of these are vaginal delivery, some cesarean, cesarean section, but uh, in neither in vaginal delivery or cesarean section were there any neurological complications. Uh, Waters uh, and colleagues had a, a slightly larger series, 2018, uh, 95 uh, babies delivered, about half and half for vaginal or C-section. And uh, of the 95 deliveries, 62 had either spinal or, uh, or epidural anaesthetic, and there were no neurological consequences. Um, and they also looked at the degree of Chiari malformation in separating those patients who had vaginal delivery versus cesarean section and really no difference in the degree of, certainly the degree of tonsil herniation. They listed the indications for those patients who underwent uh, C-section. Only 10 of the, uh, so the 44 patients had C-section, 10 of them had it because of the Chiari malformation and there were other uh, obstetric reasons. Uh, another paper from 2019, uh, 185 uh, babies being delivered. Again, uh, roughly equal vaginal and C-section, perhaps slightly more C-section deliveries. And uh, again, many of those undergoing epidural or spinal anesthesia and sometimes general anesthesia. So 34 out of the 70, out of the 105 C-sections had general anesthesia. And out of all those, uh, patients, there were no neurological complications. Here are their uh, indications for C-section, uh, obstetric reasons, but also uh, some uh, presumably because of the concern about the Chiari malformation. And then uh, Wilkinson and Adele and others, uh, that's a Cormax uh, group, I think. So. Um, this is looking at insurance claims data. This is a very large study, but not, the, not their own patients. This is from uh, an insurance claims database. They had um, in 866 patients over 1,000 uh, deliveries, and they compared, for some of the aspects of this paper, they compared the outcomes there to 11,000 uh, matched controls from the same database, so patients who did not have Chiari. So these are a th over a thousand deliveries in patients who in their records also had a diagnosis of Chiari malformation. But for some of those, the diagnosis of Chiari malformation was made after the, uh, the, um, the baby was delivered. So if, they, if we look at, so presumably these patients are then managed um, without knowledge that they had Chiari malformation. So in those patients, they had the delivery before the Chiari was diagnosed, compared to those patients who had delivery after, so that the physicians looking after them had knowledge of the Chiari malformation. And there's, we'll come to the things that were done differently, but there was really no difference in outcome. Uh, and there's no, there's a, a couple of patients with cerebrovascular accident, uh, but no neurological consequences that could be attributed to tonsil or herniation. And if you look in that same study at um, the, the outcomes, so uh, there's really no difference in the, in the groups apart from uh, um, the management, but 
there's really no difference in outcome and no uh, really no significant neurological uh, morbidity. And just to bring that in, in direct numbers, so for the Chiari patients, and when they compare them with the controls, Chiari patients had a 1% morbidity, and that's across all, all obstetric uh, um, morbidity outcomes versus 1.3% for the matched controls. So the concern, I think, from my point of view, though, is, is not that whole process, but, but is there a, a concern about inadvertent dural puncture uh, during an epidural anaesthetic or a lumbar puncture? Now, that for me, that applies whether the person's having the uh, procedure, the lumbar puncture or epidural for delivery or any other reason for Chiari patients. Is there a concern about uh, rapid deterioration if there is aspiration of CSF from the spine in Chiari patients. So there's some evidence for that. There's a few case reports. I've listed those there. None of them had any serious neurological outcomes, um, but they definitely had um, acute neurological deterioration uh, from lumbar puncture uh, in, in these Chiari patients. I have got some experience myself. So uh, I had one patient who was uh, being treated for a hematological malignancy and had a lumbar puncture done for chemotherapy. Uh, he, when the lumbar puncture was done, he immediately became unconscious, recovered over a few minutes, and then the diagnosis of Chiari malformation was made when that was investigated. Um, he, we treated him for that and he's recovered both from the malignancy and from the Chiari. I'm aware of two other patients, and these are not published, and I'm aware of them because uh, of medical legal cases. So I can't really give any precise details, um, and they certainly can't be published, but uh, I know of a woman in her 20s who had a lumbar puncture. She was not known to have Chiari, presented with symptoms suggestive of meningitis. She did not turn out to have meningitis, but had a lumbar puncture done and immediately became quadriplegic. Uh, it took them a while to make the diagnosis that she had Chiari malformation. She did not have decompression surgery until the next day, and she's had no recovery. I'm aware of another patient who was known to have Chiari malformation. It was not, it had not been treated. She was in her 30s, and during pregnancy, she had a lumbar puncture again for possible, for concern about meningitis, which she did not have, so there was no meningitis, and she developed respiratory arrest and death and died from uh, from that. So there are cases. Um, it's not uh, clearly not common, um, but there are cases, certainly in the in the literature and in my own experience of acute deterioration uh, after lumbar puncture. None of those, of course, during the process of uh, delivery, though. And then just quickly about those issues in patients with syringomyelia. Um, there was a paper from 2017 by Garvey and colleagues. Uh, they had their own cases and did a systematic review of the literature and identified 43 deliveries in 39 patients. Uh, 13 of those had uh, vaginal delivery with uh, the majority of those having epidural anaesthetic, but 30 of them having caesarean section. And in, in none of those patients was there any neurological worsening during the process of delivery. So uh, they listed here the reasons given for uh, caesarean delivery. So the majority here were done because there was concern about the syringomyelia being worsened in the process of Valsalva maneuvers during the, during the delivery. Uh, there are, I was able to find uh, two reports of neurological worsening of uh, patients with syringomyelia during the pregnancy. So this is not during the delivery, but um, in I think both of these cases, immediately prior to delivery, um, where the patients developed worsening of the uh, neurological symptoms related to syringomyelia. And certainly in, in at least the second case, the patient was then uh, induced, had the baby delivered and recovered neurologically. So. I was not able to identify any reports of significant neurological uh, 
consequences of either uh, pregnancy or delivery, uh, either by a vaginal or, or a C-section. So a slightly different question though, of course, which is what, what is actually done? So, you know, what, what are the concerns and what is actually done? What's done in practice? How do people manage uh, patients with Chiari malformation? And the best information here is the publication from Cormac's group uh, that I mentioned earlier with the large insurance data, uh, where they were able to compare the management um, of patients either with knowledge of the Chiari malformation or without knowledge of the Chiari malformation and compared to, to controls. So this is a little bit different to the, the other studies where they looked at the outcomes of management, but not really compared, are these patients being managed differently to, to other patients, right? So, uh, so here, there is a slightly increased uh, rate of, um, of C-section in patients who are known to have Chiari malformation um, I think is the, the, uh, is the main point to be noted there. And in comparison with um, uh, here, the control group is those patients who had the delivery before the Chiari malformation diagnosis, so they did have Chiari, but weren't known to have it, versus those who had the delivery known to have Chiari malformation. And this is the use of cesarean section. So uh, there is a... a, a a higher, uh, over time, perhaps becoming higher, rate of C-section in those patients who are known to have Chiari malformation. And then the use of neuraxial analgesia um, is uh, less in those patients with Chiari malformation. And I think that's presumably because of the concern that I mentioned about inadvertent lumbar puncture and loss of CSF in those patients. So there is a difference uh, possibly increasing over time. And the final thing I wanted to just mention is that there are some comments in, um, in studies like this, where this is a paper in this journal, Alzheimer's and Dementia, but the title of the paper was Consensus Guideline for Lumbar Puncture in Patients with Neurological Diseases. And in that publication, they have said that Arnold Chiari malformation is a contraindication to do a lumbar puncture. And in the text, they said that is because of concern about uh, exacerbation of tonsillar herniation and neurological deficit, but they gave absolutely no evidence for that uh, recommendation. So it's, it's a recommendation, um, but without evidence. So my view is that the su in summary, the evidence is that there is absolutely no evidence for adverse outcomes of pregnancy or delivery, uh, adverse neurological outcomes of pregnancy or delivery in Chiari or syringomyelia patients. And despite what is a probably a, a reasonable concern, there's no published evidence for adverse outcomes related to neuraxial anesthesia uh, in Chiari or syrinx patients. So what does that mean in, in practice for me? Um, so, in, in general, I, I don't put any restrictions on Chiari patients in terms of their physical activity um, and certainly for successfully treated patients with a post-operative scan showing a, a good cisterna magna that they have, I put no restrictions on them whatsoever. For those patients who have a severe Chiari malformation, and, and of course this is a very subjective thing, but if there is really complete loss of CSF around the foramen magnum, I do advise, and, it's not, and they're not treated, I do advise those patients to avoid lumbar puncture and epidurals, not just in pregnancy and delivery, but at all times, because of those rare uh, cases that I'm aware of. In general though, I don't see that there's any special reason um, for those patients to be advised to have a caesarean section. With regard to syringomyelia, I, again, I don't, generally put these patients on any restrictions and certainly if they've had a successfully treated syrinx, there would be no restrictions. For a person with a, and again, very subjective here, if they have an untreated small syrinx, there would be no restrictions. If a patient had a large 
Um, and and I, I think of this as a, you know, how tense is the syrinx? Is the syrinx really enlarging the spinal cord and, um, and um, putting the cord at risk? And, uh, and we all know that patients can develop neurological loss from coughing and, and sneezing. That, that can precipitate uh, acute neurological loss. I do advise those patients to avoid straining and valsalva uh, manoeuvres, and that would include um, include bearing down during delivery. So in the hypothetical situation where a patient like that was pregnant and uh, there was a question about the method of delivery, I, I would advise that patient to have a C-section. But that's hypothetical because well, I've never come across that because patients with that type of syrinx generally get treated. Um, but that would be my advice. So um, I think that's the that's the end there. Just I'll end on that slide. So thanks very much for inviting me again, and uh, I hope that's been helpful. Thank you, Dr. Sudley. Uh, that was great. Um, before we wrap up, any qu Dr. Quigley, do you have a question? Yeah, I do, uh, Dr. Sidley. I thought you, if I understood you correctly, you, you talked about, uh, or you mentioned uh, severe Chiari where there is no flow through the foramen magnum. Is that is that correct? That's what I was saying. So, if in the situation where, uh, you know, it's, this is a very subjective thing, isn't it? But if if I'm looking at the scan, I'm thinking if that person had lumbar puncture, and CSF comes out of the spine, is there an opportunity for CSF from the head to get into the spine easily? And if not, I think there's a risk of the tonsillar herniation becoming worse. Um, and I think that's what has happened in those cases that I mentioned where there was acute neurological deterioration. If the person's got a less severe malformation and there is CSF dorsal to the cerebellum, you know, regardless of the extent of herniation, it's, I think it's all about the, the ability for CSF to pass across the frame magnum. If that's not impaired, then I have less concern. The, the reality of course is if you, if you look at the literature, I was going to say, if you look at the literature, then there should be no restrictions, right? Because it, there's really no evidence of any significant problems occurring here. Well, that, this is interesting. I've done measurements, I guess, on 100 Curie patients. I And, you know, I'm not a physician. I'm a physicist, so my knowledge of this is limited. but. Uh, for all of those, uh, you did see the, you know, abnormalities that almost certainly result from elevated pressures, but I, I never saw anybody with uh, greatly depressed CSF flow going through the frame and magnum. It certainly would be interesting to look at such data like that. That'd be, uh, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there a reference for, for patients like that or an article? You mean in in terms of impaired CSF flow across the frame magnum? Right. You you see abnormalities in CSF flow, but if you do on an axial PCR scan, if you total up all the velocities for each pixel over the uh, over a cardiac cycle. Uh, the the volume of CSF going through the frame and magnum is is the same. Uh, if you average it, well, yeah, that's exactly what I, I wanted to say. Which, uh, like I say, that's that's just my experience. So I'm. And the, but I think I think uh, you're right. That the, the majority of Chiari patients, that I'm sure that's right because the there is still enough space for CSF to get through. But I think I think all of us would um, would have seen patients where the the constriction of the frame magnum is so great that there really is no capacity for CSF to go across. And, it's, and these are uncommon patients, I think, and that's why that's why um, these cases of uh, deter sudden deterioration are pretty uncommon. Well, that's very interesting information. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Marr, I know he said he was in the car, so he, he wrote in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually out of the car now, uh, Caitlin. Um, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that presentation, Marcus. And I, I think it's a really important topic that doesn't get enough attention. 
Um, and just just completely agree with everything you said. I think for the vast majority of QRA patients, um, I think the best obstetric care is what the best obstetric care would be uh, under normal uh, circumstances taking the QRA out of the count. And, and just like you said, I think the exception of that are the really severe ones with the big cervical syrinxes that are symptomatic because they're just there's not enough data on that to feel very confident. Um, but I think you know the the general run of the mill QRAs I think we can feel confident about that it's going to be okay. So great presentation, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. No, I, I was really just reiterating your paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good <laughs> uh, Any other questions? Okay, 